Good morning, Mountaintop. How are you guys today? Awesome. <laughs> Amen. Don't you guys, um, aren't you guys really great? You're in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to read a portion of scripture in Psalms 63. It says, God, you are my God. I can't get enough of you. I've worked up so much hunger and thirst for God, traveling across the dry and the weary desert. Doesn't that sound like the res? The dry and the weary desert? <laughs> Amen. Um, so here I am in the place of worship, which you guys are in today. Eyes open, drinking in your strength and glory, which is what we're going to be getting later today. Pastor's going to bring forth a word. In, in your generous love, I am really living at last. My lip brims praises like fountains. I bless you every time I take a breath. My arms wave like banners of praise to you. Isn't that awesome? Our arms are like banners waving to God when we praise the Lord. Thank you. Well, we want to welcome you to Mount Top Church this morning. If you are joining us online, um, stand up in your living room and praise God. You are in your own personal living room, so you can dance any way that you want. <laughs> you can sing as loud as you want, but join us this morning. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we just come before you today. God, we worship you, Lord God. We exalt you, Lord, because you are worthy, God, of our praise. And God, we just come before you and we welcome you in this place, Lord. We long and we thirst for more of you, God. And God, we just pray that this morning, Lord, that you will come and kiss this place, Lord. And God, as we worship you, Lord God, as we hear your message and your word today, God, let it be food to our souls, Lord God. Let it give us strength, Lord God. And God, we just pray that this morning, God. We exalt you and we worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to have you guys go ahead and stand with us this morning and let's sing some worship songs. Hallelujah. He's our lion and our lamb this morning. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the 
chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb for who can stop the lord almighty stop the Lord Almighty. No one can. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord Stop the Lord. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. you God <clears throat> Perfect in all of your ways. 
perfectness Lord that everything that you've done is for us and for our glory because you love us Lord we just thank you Lord for your presence here today Lord God and Lord just be with us as we go through the service today Father just seeking after you just ask God that you would just continue to to do do the work that you've already started in our hearts today Father and we just ask God that you would just uh, have your way in each and every one of our hearts in your name we pray amen amen Go guys, go ahead and have a seat. So, you know, God's presence and God's glory is best place to be in ever, you know. And, it's, and so I just was sitting back here earlier just while we were praising and worship, just really just embracing God and just really just, just, just enjoying being in his presence. So, you know, let, as we kind of transition from, from the praise and uh, entering into the glory, let's, let's transition into a, another type of worship that we do. And, you know, we talk about our tithes and our offerings every week. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about earlier was uh, John D. Rockefeller. You know, one of the things that he, he was asked was, how much is enough? He always said, one more dollar. Just one more dollar, Right. But you know what? God in Christ in, talked about greed, talked about where our, our desires are. But then he also, in that same, kind of that same section there, and I'm thinking of uh, right now looking at Luke 12, uh, where he, he talks about our greed and that leading without, with our greed and not trusting on God is, is really life without God. But then he, Christ starts talking about having... Faith, having trust, and not having that anxiety about knowing what's coming next. So having that, that idea of, okay, greed is bad, but you know what? You can trust God. You can trust, trust your Father for everything that you need. Uh, so I'm going to just read from a couple scriptures here. Not scriptures, a couple verses here. Um, 
in Luke 12, starting verse uh, 31. It says, but seek his kingdom and these things will be provided to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, because your father has chosen to give you the kingdom. Uh, Verse 33 says, sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts that do not wear out. An inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor does a moth destroy. And then verse 34 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so, you know, if we, if we really truly trust God, why do we try to gather up all these possessions? Why do we try to, try to gather up all this money so that we're, we're never going to really end up being able to spend it in our lifetimes anyway? You know, I know um, a lot of us, we, we just make it day by day, but we also have that trust that God is going to provide for us in everything that we do. You know, but when we have extra, that means we don't sit back and hoard it. We, we give it back to God because we know God has provided through us and everything that we have done. And he will continue to provide through for us in, what, in, his, in life. And so, you know, we do want to prepare for the future. We want to do have, have those things. But we also want to be able to just trust God and say, okay, God, you know what? I trust you. I'm going to give you what I, what my heart desires to give you, and just be, uh, and be like, okay, God, let's just go for it. Let's really see where your your Holy Spirit is leading and directing. Um, you know, sometimes like that widow, giving that last little bit of those last few pennies that we own to God can be really difficult, but. At the end of the day, we're putting our treasure in heaven when we put our faith in him. When we put our trust in God, everything that we do. You know, that tithe is God's no matter what, where, where, where it goes, whatever we do with it. it that tithe is God's. And that, that needs to just go back straight to God. But anything over and above that, that offering really comes out of our hearts for him. So really, let's just be mindful of what we do with the money that God gives us on a, on a weekly, monthly, daily basis, however we get paid or however we get money. But really, let's just put our focus on him, building up those treasures, building up that storehouse in heaven, because that's what it really matters. At the end of the day, we can't take it with us. So let's just really focus on uh, doing the best that we can with what God has given us for the kingdom. And then that's where the treasures will be, and we'll see that in heaven. And so let's just uh, continue to think about that as we uh, just continue on with our service. Uh, so let's just, uh, we'll go ahead and pray, and then we'll just continue on with our, um, our praise and worship. Dear Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your presence here. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, guiding and directing and everything that we've uh, said so far today. And I pray, Lord, that uh, every word that is said from the front, front that is from the pulpit, would be from you and you alone, and that everything that we in our hearts are desiring right now is just for more of you and not not anything of our own selfishness, not anything of our own greed, but God, that everything that we desire is for you and you alone. Because ultimately, Lord, you are the source for everything. You are the source that we we have. And I just pray, Lord, that we would just continue to rely on you in, in everything that we have, that all our, all our actions would be uh, solely dedicated to you, Lord. Uh, be with us for the rest of the service. In your name we pray. Amen. You can stand with us for this last song. And as Tim was speaking this morning, I was just thinking about the fact that we just came off our youth convention and how when we invest in God's kingdom, there is so much more to gain from that. There's no such greater eternal reward for that type of investment. And that's something that we can't fully grasp what God is going to bless us or what God is going to use that for in the future. Not just now in this earthly mindset but in eternity and how important it is so to invest not just the kingdom but just lives because that's something we can't get back amen I love you, Lord, oh, your mercy never fails me, and all my days I am held in your hands. 
From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night you were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have believed of the goodness of God Come on, church And all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able oh i will see of the goodness of god because your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm I surrender, surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God oh I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Hey Amen. How many of you know God's been good to you this morning? Anybody? <laughs> How many of you know that God is so good to us? Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless you. Yeah, let's acknowledge him. Can we just give him a praise? A hand clap of praise, a shout praise, whatever praise you brought. 
Amen. God is so, so good to us. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. And I want to say thank you for being with us this morning. And uh, I'm Pastor Jackie Holgate. Uh, my wife, Lenora, she's sitting right here. And uh, we just want to say welcome to all of you. If you're a first-time visitor, brother, thank you for joining us all the way from Colorado uh, and this morning. And uh, so he was early to church too, everybody. Those of you that live here in town, if you were late, shame on you. Somebody came all the way from Colorado. And so, but anyway, just give him a warm mountaintop church welcome. Amen. God bless you, brother. Good to have you. Now, if you're a first-time visitor, thank you for joining us. And, uh, you know, we're just people that love Jesus in this place. That's all we are. We're all sinners saved by grace. Uh, nobody's better than anybody in this room, right? Uh, but we're all uh, servants of, of Jesus, and we're his children. And this morning, I want to say welcome to all of you. Those of you that are logging online, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, we want you to know that we're uh, aware of your presence with us. Uh, there are many people that join us on our uh, different uh, platform that we use, and people are always reaching out even through, the, through, through technology, and thank God for that. How many of you know that technology is good when it's working? And when it's not working, it's like you want to throw it away, right? <laughs> but uh, praise God for technology. So, yeah, and uh, God, uh, so uh, that was Navajo, if you didn't understand that. And so when we get to heaven, we'll be talking that language. I just want you guys to know that, okay? <laughs> It's a heavenly language. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so I want to say again, welcome. Uh, we have got some announcements we want to pass along to you. Uh, we got different things going on in our body and our church. We want you to be uh, aware of some of the things that are happening. And so partner with us in some of these things, okay? And so we're going to go ahead and cue that up at this time. Uh, let's play our announcement at this time. Well, hey there, Mount Top Church. My name is Angie. We are so excited that you are able to join us, whether it is in person, live on Facebook, or YouTube. Before we continue our service, there are a few announcements for you and your family to stay connected this coming week. We continue to express our thank you for your support for Mount Top Project Hope. If you would like to participate or contribute, you can simply let us know, or you can visit our website and donate at Project Hope. Your donations matter. Don't forget to come out and join us for our prayer meetings on Sunday evening at 6 p.m. for individual or corporate prayer. For more information, please connect with Brother Tim or Sister Jenny Harrison. Come out and join us for a midweek Bible study that happens every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. here at Mountaintop Church. We hope to see you there. Your prayers and your support for Arizona Native Youth Convention was greatly appreciated. Hey guys, Water Baptismal will be taking place on April 21st. If you have not been baptized and are interested in getting baptized, please connect with Pastor Lynette or Pastor Jackie as soon as possible. Pastor's preaching class, Fire in My Bones, will be taking place on April 21st. For more information, please connect with Pastor Jackie. The pastors will be attending the Arizona Ministry Network Conference on April 15th and the 16th in Surprise, Arizona. Let's keep them in our prayers. Ties and offering, we do support missionaries around the world. There are several ways that you can continue to give your ties and your offering. You can visit our website for more detailed information. We hope that you will experience the love of God, the peace of Jesus, and the joy of the Holy Spirit. We love you, and we hope to see you next week. Have a blessed week. Amen. Amen. Those are our announcements. Uh, please be aware of all of our announcements. Somebody say next week. Next week. Come on, nudge your neighbor and say next week. next week. All right, next week on Sunday, we're going to be doing water baptism, okay? We're going to be dunking people into the water, and we promise we'll take them out. So uh, just let them know that uh, we, uh, we, we're so excited about that, what God has in store uh, through that uh, process that we uh, all go through at one point or another, and so I want to encourage all of us, if uh, you know of someone that needs to be baptized in water, let, let us know so we can do that for them. Uh, it's always an honor to do that. And so uh, this morning, I want to remind you, and then also next week, the same day that we're doing water baptism, in the evening, we will be having our uh, Fire in My Bones class, which is basically uh, a class that I'll be leading. We're going to be teaching you how to prepare a sermon, how to deliver deliver a sermon, and uh, we're going to continue with that on Sunday evenings where we'll start having services again, 
and we'll have some of the students begin to present the Word of God and just kind of raise them up to preach. And uh, that's what Jesus commissioned his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And look what he says, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you so that they too will do the same thing. And so I want to encourage all of us uh, to get involved in that. If you feel uh, uh, just a call on your life, and if you want to experience that, you can come and join us for that class, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go from there and see what happens. And uh, next thing you know, we'll be sending people out of this house to preach different places. Uh, there are so many churches that are vacant out on the reservation they don't have pastors on, and, and churches on the reservation. We can send people there, coordinate it with their uh, local body, and just, you know, make it happen. And so we can have maybe two guys or two gals or uh, a couple and send them out there so that they can be part of what God's uh, great uh, commission is to us, is to tell people of the good news that Jesus loves them, and that Jesus can save, and Jesus can deliver them. And so that's what we're going to be doing, and I want to encourage all of you to be mindful of that. Uh, let that be on your radar. So a week from uh, next, uh, today, a week from today, we'll be doing water baptism, and we'll be starting our classes in the evening, okay? Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and have Jenny come. Uh, this past weekend, we had some students go uh, to our Arizona Native Youth Convention, and uh, uh, part of that is uh, our heart is to reach students in this region uh, to just encourage them, to come alongside them and equip them and, you know, uh, bring people in that will speak into their life and encourage them as well. And so that's what happened since Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We just got back yesterday late afternoon, and then we have to turn around and get ready for services this morning and this afternoon. And so I'm going to have Sister Jenny come. She's our youth leader here at our church, and uh, she'll take it from there. Go ahead. All right. So thanks. First of all, I just want to say, so well, actually, first of all, students and leaders that were at the convention, if you guys want to start coming up um, so you guys can share your testimony or just share stuff that you guys learned. But um, while they're coming up, I just want to personally just say thank you to anybody that sponsored a student, anybody that contributed to our food sales, anybody that bought from the food sales. You know, these students wouldn't have been able to necessarily make it down there without your guys' support. So just want to, you know, say kudos. Thank you for all uh, that, that helped. And um, these students are truly amazing. We want to thank you, parents and families, for trusting us with your students. Um, like th this is the next generation, right? This is the these are our next leaders. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys, for for pouring into them. So, I'll let the the students speak first, and then um, I will close this out. So, since show you're here, you get to go first. Hi, my name's Show. Um, the trip itself is actually really fun. The first day we got there. It was a lot, but at the same time, it was really entertaining. Um, first day, it was really powerful. He came really hard. And um, the first day, we got to let go of a lot of baggage we were holding on. Yes. And one thing, <clears throat> the first day, he was talking about how Jesus was walking on water and how Peter and some other people were in the boat and how Peter jumped into the water and um, Peter started sinking and Jesus had to like, Peter was calling out for Jesus for him to help and Jesus went over there and helped him. He was, um, brought him out of the water and helped him walk back to the boat. And the other people, they didn't want to jump out because they were afraid of sinking. And the point of that is that you can't really do a lot alone. And you just like, you want to walk with, you want to walk with Jesus. But at the same time, you're going to need him to help you walk along the way. It's going to be scary and it's going to be a lot. But at the same time, it's going to be pretty easy. If you help, if you have him helping you, it's it's just gonna be a, it's really easy. Mm. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, hi, my name is Tayden. Um, <laughs> this is like, I don't know, fourth time going, some of like that. But uh, I had a good time. And then, <sighs> on those three days, I took something from the second day, I think it was. And John Weasel was speaking, and he was telling a story of how he went on a hike with his family, like a really long hike. And on that hike, uh, it was rocky and rough for the trail. So his family was saying how like how rough the trail was, and like they should just give up and go back. But they kept going. And then when they reached the end of the trail, they arrived to a big lake. And then that lake, they had like clear water where you could see the fishes. And then it was really nice, they said. And then the kids and them, they were saying how it was worth it to go on the hike and that they stayed on the trail. And then what I took from that is that when you go on a walk with God, it's going to be rough and you don't know where you're going, but it's best to keep your trust in God and all that. And that it's, even though you don't know where, where you're going to go, it's best to keep your faith in God, and then the outcome would be best. So, yeah. Hi, um, my name's Elizabeth. Um, what I learned at youth, uh, the youth convention was it's, it's hard to move on from by if you keep looking at the mistakes in your past. Um, I didn't think I was good enough to turn to the Lord and ask for help or forgiveness because I thought he would be mad at me, even though <clears throat> he said, I will not leave you or forsake you. But it was hard for me to ask for forgiveness because I didn't think, that help, like asking for help was a good thing, even though it's okay to um, ask for help from the Lord because he knows what you're going through, even though you don't tell anyone. He knows what you went through. Even if you feel bad, um, he still won't leave you or forsake you. And so on the first day, I... I went up to one of the youth pastors and I asked for forgiveness and help me to to um try and like for like encourage other students in my school to and encourage them to get to know Jesus but I have been scared many times to talk about him and the first day when I said to Jesus to remove the people that aren't um, supposed to be in my life, a whole group of friends left me, and it felt really hard, but I kept praying for Jesus to guide me, and it was really hard, but you know, I'm like making it through by praying to Jesus about my problems and Amen. it's hard but with the Lord anything is possible hello my name is Jackie and this was my second youth convention this convention has really touched my heart um, I've learned more about God, and yeah. Um, one of the stories that, <laughs> I forgot his name. No, it was the comedy person. James. Um, yeah, <laughs> James was talking about a story. I think it was James. Um, he was saying that you need to make your own path and not follow other people. He told a story about um, a, like a clinic 
and there's a bunch of seating and everything. And this, there was a bell, like a little ring. And when every time that little ring ringed, um, this one guy would stand up and sit back down. <laughs> yeah. And um, that bell would ring. He would stand up and sit back down. Other people were confused about what he was doing, so they didn't know what to do. So every time that bell rang, he would stand up, then this other person would stand up and sit back down. Basically, he was following what that guy was doing. Then one by one, every person was getting called to go see the doctor or whatever, and there's one old lady walked in and everyone was gone, but this one guy was sitting and she sat down. The bell rang, rang again and he stood up and sat back down. She was confused about what she was gonna do, whether she should sit back up or sit back down. And then she sat there and he got called he got called to see the doctor, and the bell rang, and she sat there wondering if she could stood up. So she stood up and sat back down. <laughs> and then um, more people came inside the clinic, and they all sat down. The, bang, the bell rang again. She stood up, she sat back, sat back down. Everyone was so, co so confused about what she was doing. So the bell rang once again. She stood up, then this other person stood up, and everyone just started following what she was doing. They all sat back down again. Next, you know, she got called. She got called to go see the doctor, and this one guy heard the bell ring, and he was wondering if he could st like, stand up and sit back down. So. He stood up, sat back down, and everyone was confused. And every, like, it kept repeating and repeating. Then, yeah, <laughs> it like, shows that you need to start your own path and not follow what other people are doing. Hi, my name is Nevaeh. Um, this is actually my last convention. Um, so while I was over there, I felt like I haven't actually been in church for a while. So I felt like I kind of needed to go. Um, so during that time, I was carrying a lot of baggage and just a lot of stuff that I've been going through. Um, but during this time that I felt like I had to give myself to the Lord again. So I think one of the things that really... I don't know, all the messages really um, got me, but I think it was really the workshops. The workshops helped me a lot, and, you know, I just got prayed over and everything like that, but um, I don't know, all the stories that they've told were things that really impacted me, and one of the workshops had to do with, like, drug substances, and, like, he was explaining why you guys shouldn't like, do that because it can lead to a different path instead of God. Um, the second worship or workshop, it was about him. It was about this girl, and it was kind of about what she was going through through all her mental health, and I kind of related. So, but one of the messages that really struck me was... Um, It was the first day. It was about when Peter went into the boat. And it was kind of just talking about, like, how you need to get out of that comfort and you need to let go of your past to go into the future. And, you know, just to focus on God. And you can't really be doing that by looking in the past. So I let that all go at the altar. So, yeah, thank you. Hello, my name is Rylan. Uh, this is my first time going to any convention. And 
It was really good. I liked it. I got to be in touch with the Lord. And on the second day was when he really touched uh, my heart and uh, the late night thing with James. And yeah, where he talked about when he was running a race or something in here where you have to run and run, but you can't look behind you and look at the steps or you might trip. Where he was saying stuff like, where you got to keep your eyes forward and not look behind you, like looking on your past and stuff like that. It was... It was fun, and the second day was nice. The workshop that I went to was having faith in a family or something crisis. And there's two ways you can go if there's like a death or where you can still be in touch with God or you can be mad and start to curse God out, but... There's always a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. My name is Keegan. This was my like third or fourth time going. But something I took from it was once you give your life to God, he will put you through hard stuff. And you'll be on your knees, but you have to get back up. And, you know... Just because something hard happens, you can't just stay on your knees. You have to keep going through it and stay happy with good times. And and main event was fun, too. It was bowling I kept missing. but (laughs) I had to just keep thinking of good stuff. And then, like, the second round, I was actually hitting up more. I still got less... Second to last place, though. Um, I can't really remember anything else, though, because we didn't, we didn't get that much sleep. Just, we, we got back at, like, 11, went to bed at 12, then woke up at, like, 6 to 7. It was hard. But that's really all I can really remember. So honestly, that was my first time at the convention, and then like I can't remember anything because we only we came back at eleven and again <laughs> slept. And then wake up at seven and eat breakfast, and then yeah, at the at the cemetery or whatever you call it. <laughs> um, but um, John Weasel he um, preached about Peter, and then like and then. I don't know what else to explain, but it was it was a good experience, and then I enjoyed it, and then it was good. Uh, hi, my name is Trayvon. Um, this is my second time going. Uh, one thing I got out from this is a uh, workshop with. Uh, my dad and her daughter doing a workshop in the chapel. They were talking about loss because they experienced it when they lost, when the father lost one of her da- daughters and lost, the other one lost her sister. I take that from that because I experienced loss a few times. Hurts a lot. Um, or things like uh, pain trauma or other stuff. Um, she also used um, other pains in her life 
Uh, for example, she said that she distanced herself from God, thinking that it would have been better, even though it made it worse. Uh, other things like um, being distant from other people, um, I take from that because I didn't like, I didn't feel like I should go, I should do this myself because it's my own problem. But I'm, um, other stuff from what she said is that there's, it's going to hurt, but we pray to God that he, he will help you take it out, help you with that. Thank you. Hi, my name's Aaliyah. Um, what I learned to from this was to be an unstoppable generation, you have to have determined, determination, discipline, and trust. Trust that God knows your future and everything you've gone through. Uh, and like um, Jackie said, the, don't follow through with social conformity because everyone else is doing it doesn't mean you have to and allow the Holy, Holy Spirit to change you. My name is Tristan. Uh, this is my second time going to a youth convention. And what I learned from un the Unstoppable Generation was Pastor, uh, uh, Pastor John Weasel said he took a hike. His wife said they took a six-mile hike up to up at the Rocky Mountains. And it was a six-mile hike up. And they were walking up. They'll take breaks each hour. And they would, uh, his two sons would say, let's go back. It's too long, too far. And they just kept going until the last mile. They finished through it. They reached a lake, with, and it was so beautiful how he said it. It was uh, a big lake with trees, maybe some, uh, the sky is probably colored, you know, orange a little bit. And uh, so uh, he said his, his his one of his sons said i'm glad we didn't give up and i'm glad we made it here believe in god hi my name is tayden and this is my first year going but i learned that even though the road doesn't look good always trust god Hello, my name is Clarence. I'm a first timer too, so uh, I, uh, uh, Ty and I drove the van down with him and um, had a good experience. It's was, it was pretty, pretty amazing how all these young kids would go up there and praise the Lord. And, uh, worship team was excellent, and um, oh my goodness, was, if I was younger, I would have been, I would have liked to have gone. But um, younger folks out there that didn't go, you need to go experience it once at least um thank you for the parents who gave their time and money and to send their kids down appreciate it um just like uh, they were saying um peter uh he stepped out of the boat and uh, as he was walking towards god he kind of kind of took his eyes off um and got distracted but um Jesus came and took him out of the water, and but that, that's what we got to live by. We got to um, keep your eyes upon Jesus. We can't, um, even though there's distractions around us, we still got to keep our eye on Jesus. So, um, and um, parents, we got to we got to help these kids. They've they've got a new life in Christ now. We got to help them pray. We got to uh, sit down with them and talk to them about the Lord. So. Um, and uh, we got to do all that. That's that's our responsibility. We got to bring these guys up into the church. So, um, other than that, it was pretty good. Real good. I, um, I think I'll try and go again next time.
if they let me. <laughs> okay. Good job, guys. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, I had a good time uh, taking the kids down. It's always fun to try and keep up with them. I'm still sore from the workout the other night. But it was fun. Um, what was I going to say? I always get shaky when I'm up here. Um, yeah, it was fun. I got to see uh, James June, meet him for the first time. Shook his hand. Haven't washed my hands since, so. <laughs> so if I shook your hands earlier, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, yeah, from what I took from the uh, first night, uh, John Weasel was talking about, you know, Jesus walking on water. And uh, Peter wanted to come out, so he called Peter to him. And, you know, it's so amazing that, you know, each of us hear the same story, but we get, we get something different. I think something a little more personal for each of us that we get. And for me, it was the fact that, you know, Peter came when he, he, when he was called. But the others, they stayed in the boat, in the comfort of the boat. And, you know, it, it kind of hit me, it hit, hit me a little bit harder because it made me think back. How, how many times have I just stayed in the comfort, in my own comfort zone? Instead of answering the call of God, instead of, you know, jumping out into the water. And I think, you know, I need to be getting my hands dirty. I need to be getting, my feet need to get wet. You know, it needs to, I need to be jumping out there when God calls. You know, so, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that really stuck out to me. Especially something that I had been thinking about just even before the, uh, the convention was that, you know, I can't remember which book it was out of about how, you know, the four friends take their, their friend who's paralyzed to, to Jesus and he heals them. And it just made me think about, you know, how each of us need to be friends to those, you know, who, you know, some, some, you know, some people, you know, we're, we're physically capable of doing things. But, you know, what about spiritually? Are we paralyzed spiritually that, you know, we, you know, we need friends to, to, to take us to, you know, to, to Jesus, to the feet of Jesus. And, you know, something that I seen the first night was Shosho. I seen you. It really hit me, too, is that, you know, you taking the boys up to the front during worship. And that really, you know, stuck out to me. And you, Shosho, that we need... <clears throat> We need more individuals like that to, to herd the sheep back in. <laughs> and show, show Rex, you know, I'm, I'm proud of you for doing that. You know, don't stop. You know, chase those kids up to the front. Chase the guys up to the front because they're always sitting in the back. You know, you got to chase the sheep in. So, you know, I'm proud of you. You know, keep doing that. So, yeah, so that's what, you know, re really hit me doing that. So uh, seeing that and, you know, Kids have fun too, so I want to keep doing this, trying to, trying to, you know, take them down as much as I can to see them grow, you know, and, you know, keep keep pouring into them, you know, some of your kids went, you know, your your grandkids they went, you know, keep pouring into them for the kids that didn't go. Come on, let's go, you know, don't stay don't stay in the comfort of the boat. You need to get out, get your hands dirty, get your feet wet, you know, don't be scared. You know, we're, we're going to be there with you to, you know, be, be your partner in this. Awesome. I went down um, this year as um, just kind of like serving Lynette and Pastor Jackie. Um, and my takeaway from the conference is every youth conference and every youth camp, there is, there's just like a spiritual satisfaction of seeing our young people desire and hunger God. And it, it pleases the heart of God. And I can, I went down there, like even though we had only four or five hours of sleep, you know what, it is worth it. It is worth every moment of it. So my encouragement to you is, 
as adults, thank you for your sponsorship. Thank you for your donations. Thank you for coming out on Saturdays and buying food for our food sale so we can send our students down to to the youth convention. Thank you so much. Thank you for those of you who just gave generously and said, you know what, I wanna sponsor a student this year. Thank you so much because you know what? You're investing in the kingdom of God. You are investing in what God is doing in the next generation. This year, we, we, our theme was Unstoppable Generation, and that's what we poured into these kids this year. And you know what? Every single bit of serving Lyn Lynette and Pastor Jackie was all worth it all. And you know what? I want to encourage you, maybe next year. I'm so proud that Clarence came. I'm like so happy that you came to help serve, you know, this generation. And I want to encourage you, if, if you want to come out and help us, we need help, like, with every detail of the conference. We need people to help with registration, um, selling T-shirts, sign-ups for the sports, and all of that stuff. We need people. And if you are interested in coming out and helping out, come out. Um, let Pastor Jackie know, hey, I can take three days off. Let me serve this generation. You know, let me come along with you guys. You will not regret it. I guarantee you. You will not. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you guys so much for everything. Sorry I'm late. I was watching the Masters. <laughs> um, what really stood out to me um, was uh, the first night, James June, he was uh, talking. He said his old testimony is pretty cool. And um, he said, follow your dream. And uh, what he did, he was an alcoholic, a drug addict, and um, he found God. And uh, he just followed his dream, so that was pretty sick. And um, that really stood out to me, and that's it. All right. All right, so can I just say ditto and just be done? No, just kidding. <laughs> so students, thank you. You guys can go have a seat, um, and you guys too if you want. But I just, again, just want to echo what everybody has already said. Thank you, thank you, thank you for anybody that supported these amazing youth. Um, as a, you know, as the youth pastor, it's really great watching these students just really engage with the Lord. And, you know, uh, Ty called out show, and I'll, I'll do the same thing. Just watching, watching these students come down and grab their friends and say, come, come hang out with Jesus with me. That, that is worth every single, you know, la you know, every bit of lack of sleep that we had is worth it. Watching these students engage with Jesus. And, you know, there was some other students that came with us that were not, not part of our youth ministry, but they're part of the, you know, Kayanta Church. And I encouraged the, the students before we left, you know, if you see anybody on the outskirts, don't let them be on the outskirts. Bring them in. Invite them. And I was so encouraged by all of your students just embracing them and saying, hey, come along with us. Come hang out with us. So I didn't really see any of our students alone. Like they always were with other people. And I just, I just want to say thank you to, you to the students. You guys were amazing. Thank you for just making sure you got everybody included. Um, and just a, just a couple things. One, one big thing I just wanted to point out is in our, uh, in our breakout session for the, the, for the leaders, uh, John Weasel mentioned, you know, we all, we all look for the mountaintop experiences. That's what we long for is these conferences, these things where we get to go meet with Jesus and where we get to engage with Jesus. But at the top of the mountain, there's no greenery. At the top of the mountain, there's no, not, not necessarily any flowers. You don't see any growth at the top of the mountains. Where you see the most growth is in the valleys. And it's in the valleys when we make mistakes, we mess up. And it's in the valleys where we grow and we, we get better in, is in those valleys. And that, that encouraged me that it's okay to be in the valley. We don't always have to be in the mountaintop because it's in the valleys where that's where we meet with Jesus, and we have to start at the valley to get to the top. And so that, that's what one of the, you know, that's the big thing I got out of our, our breakout sessions for the leaders. So um, again, I'll just end with this. Uh, thank you again. Um, this was a great convention. If you didn't have students that, that got to go and want to go, please encourage them to go. Um, it's, it's an amazing experience where they get to meet with Jesus, and they, you know, it's our next, it's our next generation. It's our, these are our next leaders. So just want to encourage you all with that and just again say so thank you so thanks guys <laughs> yeah.
Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jenny, uh, for uh, being our youth uh, leader. Yeah, can we just hear it for her and just thank her uh, for taking care of all the students? Did a good job. And uh, man, we are so proud of them. Uh, we had, I think, like 173 students that registered to be part of the convention. Uh, we're slowly growing. Uh, there's quite a few churches that backed out. Last minute, a lot of it has to do with finances, or they don't have gas money to get their kids down to Phoenix. Those type of situations always uh, challenging. But I get the opportunity, me and my wife, to lead as directors of uh, Arizona Native Youth Ministries. And we do uh, uh, convention, and we also do youth camp. And so those are the two uh, kind of track we run on throughout the year. And we're trying to do more like rallies and then uh, youth leaders retreat and things like that to continue to invest and pour into our youth ministry. And so, you know, God gets all the glory. We get no glory. And I want you to know that, that your prayers, your support goes a long ways. And I think uh, I want to say kudos to Ty. Uh, that first night, I saw him out in the foyer, and uh, uh, one of the girls that were a little bit out on the outskirts kind of came in and started braiding his hair and putting all kinds of stuff on there. He's just sitting there enjoying it, you know? Uh, I, it, was, it was really interesting to see that those type of things happen in those environments, and uh, it's always good to see students and leaders helping each others, encouraging each others, and just letting God be God in our midst. And so it was a great turnout. We have a good, good team that helped us get it done. So guys, thank you. God bless you. Appreciate it. At this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids to Children's Church, ages 6 to 12, ages 6 to 12. I know you guys are getting a little bit restless and uh, getting a little antsy uh, sitting in your seats. Uh, you can be dismissed at this time. All of our kids, ages 6 to 12, God bless you. And then our children, our, our nursery, ages 5 and under, 5 and under, uh, you are dismissed as well, all of our nursery folks. Now, if you have a nursery uh, uh, individual that's going to the nursery, please check them in. Uh, that way we can get a hold of you so they get all your information um, in case uh, something needs to be done uh, concerning your child. Uh, please, uh, we don't, I know that they don't typically do like diaper change and stuff like that. And so they'll reach out to you so that you can do that. Amen. So uh, it's so encouraging to see young people getting up here. And I don't know if I should do the... Uh, the, the fire in my bones class after what I heard this morning. It looks like they can already preach and, uh, you know, the bell rings, sit back down, get back up, the bell rings. You know, she was doing the, the whole nine yards. Uh, but anyway, guys, thank you. So good to have all of you this morning. Uh, let's get into the Word this morning. Now, now that uh, I've got, I don't have a whole lot of time to get the uh, content out to you. But uh, again, I want to say, uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for uh, just uh, helping us out in different ways for our youth convention. And uh, let's continue to pray for our students. Let's pray for our students. Let's pray that God will just stir them. God would encourage them. God would strengthen them. And uh, that's our prayer. So uh, this morning, let's pray, and then we'll get into the word. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what you've done over the weekend, God. Thank you for this youth convention. Thank you for everyone that partnered together to elevate your name, to make your name famous. God, from our speaker to the band to the workshop presenters, God, uh, everyone, God, every person that uh, did their part, God, even the activities, God, the sports and guys that led that, the tournaments that was that had taken place, and and Father God, just to, just we're so thankful to you for what you've done at our Arizona Native Youth Convention. And this morning, as we receive your word, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that you would challenge us. I pray that you would change us to be more like you in every way. I pray, God, that you would just use me to speak forth your word. And I don't want to say more than I need to or less than I need to. I want to just make a deposit of what you laid upon my heart this morning. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. This morning, I want to talk to you in light of our youth convention. It sounds like, it looks like all the youth left. 
Did they all take off? <laughs> I wanted to kind of talk to them. I wanted to preach to them and encourage them. Well, there's some that are still here. I want, I want to talk to the young people, and I want you as adult to listen in, and maybe God would speak to you to encourage you, that things would be reactivated in your life as the message goes forth. And so today I want to talk to you about a message entitled, God-Sized Dream. God-sized dream. How big is God-sized dream? The in God, yeah. But you know, in life, as children, as infants, as babies, as adolescents, we all dream. You dream, I dream. We all had a dream. Maybe, a, ladies, some of you, when you were small, you wanted to be a, you wanted to be a princess. Right? And you wanted your life to be this way or that way. And young men, you wanted to be maybe like an auto mechanic. And I don't know what your dream was. I, I know Brian, I think, wanted to be like a professional bull rider. Right? And so he would start, uh, he would start, uh, you know, like in his mind with his creativity would begin to even act those out. And I don't know if you did that. But I did that. I certainly did that. When I was growing up, I used to dream that I would play in the NBA. That was my dream. And I used to think I was, you know, this person in the NBA. And I, I would do this or do that. And I would act that out. And there are other things that I've done. I shared a little bit last week uh, when we were talking about David. Uh, the dream that God puts inside of us. Not a gift. So those dreams are important, church. And young people today, I want to talk to you out of uh, a couple places, but 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Timothy, Paul is speaking to young Timothy, and Paul says to Timothy, this is what he says. He says, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. And don't let them put you down. Don't let them say words or do things to discourage you is what he's saying. He said to them, but he says, but young Timothy, young people that are sitting up here in the front row, this is what Paul would say to you, but be an example or set an example for the believers in speech, how you talk. In life, in love, in faith, and in purity, he says. Until I come, Paul says, devote yourself to public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. He says, do not neglect your gift. Somebody say gift. Every one of us have a gift. You have a gift, I have a gift. And Paul says to Timothy, don't neglect that. Use it. Use that gift. Cultivate that gift. Cause that gift to be exercised in your life. And he says, which was given to you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Another place he says that fan into the flame the gift of God. That when I laid hands and I prayed uh, over you, I imparted uh, by, by the grace of God, by the commission of God, that you, Timothy, would become a pastor and that you would be an example. And so today I want to encourage you uh, uh, this, uh, this morning as, or, or this afternoon or whatever time it is, I want to encourage you to be mindful of that, to be reminded of Paul's admonition to young Timothy as he was pastoring a church in Ephesus or in Ephesians. And so that's what is happening here. Stand. Be an example. See, when you stand, you're an example to somebody. People are watching. People are listening. People are observing how you're going to respond. Are you going to get mad? And are you going to, you know, take your toys and go home? Or are you going to stay and let others use your toys and even if they abuse it? Come on. Right? You see, some of us, we, we're, we're so irritable or we're so uh, short-tempered or whatever it might be. And, and so part of the process is this, us trusting God to grow us, 
Nilzetoles, Nichitziltitles, Ado, Adinga, which the neat Ilya, Nichel Yahagi Chil Indoles, the gift that's given to us, we are to use it. And so perhaps uh, this morning you're here and you're thinking, Pastor, where are you going with this? Well, let me go to the book of Genesis, chapter 37. Genesis, what's Kagi? Genesis chapter 37, for, the, for, uh, for time's sake, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the shorter version. So when you get home, you make sure you read all the, the chapter in chapter 37. So, the Bible says in Genesis uh, chapter 37, verse 5, Joseph had a dream. Din gabzat in the show. Joseph nagizged nila. Joseph had a dream, and we and when he told it to his brothers, look what it says. They hated him all the more. He said to them, "Listen," he said, "to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my shaft rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it." Is what he says. He's telling the dream. And he says this, look in verse 8. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us, you little snotty brat? Is probably what's not in there. The best probably what they're saying or thinking, he says, do you intend to reign over us? Well, you actually rule us. And look what happened. They hated him. They hated their young brother who had a dream. And look what it says, all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And he goes on to say this in verse 9, then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bound down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Well, you, well, well, your mother and I, the sun and the moon, and your brothers, the 11 stars, actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him. They were jealous of their brother, Joseph. But his father kept the matter in mind, the scripture says. Down to verse number 11, I believe it is. And let's jump over to verse number 18. It says, but when they saw him in the distance, before he reached them, he, they plotted to kill him. So what happened is this. The brothers take the sheep out. They were out in the field taking sheep from place to place because of vegetation. And so the father said to Joseph, Joseph, go check on your brothers. See how they're doing. And so when the, he goes to look for them, he, he can't find them. So he goes to a couple different places and an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph, uh, to Joseph and says, Joseph, your brothers are in such and such a place. So he comes to them and I think it's a place called Dalton. And as he comes to them, look what happened. They saw him at a distance. The brothers recognized Joseph. Joseph, before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Because they didn't like him. They despised him. They looked down on him as Paul admonished Timothy not to happen in his life. They said, look, come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these empty wells or cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dream. When Reuben heard this, one of the older brothers heard this the brothers were talking among themselves. He tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, is what he said. And the Bible tells us he was trying to cause his brother to escape uh, the, the jealousy, the anger, uh, the plot that was put against him. And you know the rest of the story. So perhaps this story is one of the most beloved story in all the Bible. The, the story of Joseph. Joseph You see, Joseph is a picture of Jesus himself. Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Joseph Jesus He came onto the scene as a young man with a powerful dream. 
and a vision given to him from God. He was used by God to become this powerful leader in a foreign land, and his dream was used by God to impart plans for the future plans for his life and provision that God was going to do and the power to execute all of God's sovereignty. God's power will take place as this dream was given to Joseph. Children are a great example of this concept. You see, God many times will work through children, and here Joseph was just a child, and yet God used him to do all these things. You see, Paul the Apostle told the younger Timothy to accept the call of God. When they laid hands on him by the elders to do ministry in the same way. And as we tell the story today, the first thing is this. What is a God-sized dream? You see, Joseph had a dream, the Bible said, that came from God. And I believe these type of dreams, we must pray for it. We must pray for our God-given dream. You see, many of us stop dreaming altogether. Many of us are content with the status quo. Many of us live so far below the calling of God because we have stopped dreaming. Can I encourage you today to ask God to restore your dream? Can I encourage you today to ask God to reactivate your dream, to reignite your dream once more? Why did you stop dreaming? See, a lot of us would say today, I stopped dreaming because I became an adult. Right? We call it adulting. When you become an adult, all you start thinking about is bills. All you start thinking about is status and titles and, and this and the other. And you're trying to build your portfolio. You're trying to elevate yourself so that you can have a future in your life and you stop dreaming. I want to encourage you today to ask God, Lord, give me a dream. Renew the dream in my life so that I can go forth and so that I can do what God called me to do. You see, how do you know it's a God-given dream? We'll talk about that here in a bit. Before I do that, I want to give you a quote. A quote by a guy named T.E. Lawrence. He said this, All men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds awake to a day to find it was all vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men. For many, for they may act out their dreams with open eyes to make it possible. How many of us daydream? How many of us in our mind we say, God, inspire me as you pray. God begins to put dreams inside of you. You dream with your eyes open and you begin to see the vision that God gives you. You will see the vision. You will see the dreams. That's why the Bible says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he says this, look, that your old man will dream dreams and your young men will see vision. It will be poured out even on your whole household. You see, church, I believe there's so much power in a vision. There's so much power in dreams that God gives to us, and we must pray for that. God gives dream to dangerous men. And I believe we had a couple dangerous young people in our midst this past weekend. And as the preacher were coming and the workshop presenters were coming, and as they were pouring forth God's word into their life, there was dreams being ignited. There were visions being ignited about not being a follower and not just doing what everybody else is doing, but being a leader and stepping out and standing up and being counted. Come on, church. We need to encourage our young people to be called by God. Don't play the devil's advocate, mom. 
Don't, tempt, don't play the devil's attitude, dad. And tell your kids that's not for you when they tell you they want to go into the ministry. When they tell you they want to be used by God because it burns inside of them. And I want to encourage you today. The greatest thing we can do for our kids is to back them up and pray for them and cheer them on and say, yes, son, yes, daughter, you can do it. Whatever God tells you to do, you do it with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might, all that is within you. You do what God called you to do. What is a God dream? Well, number one, a God-given dream is always bigger than you. It's always bigger than you. The ingab it's other na ikef na iliago. It's not that a yoda at ego. It's going to be way bigger than you because if you can handle it, if you can fulfill that dream, if you can accomplish that dream, that was not from God. That was from you. And you will get the glory. You will get the praise. You see, when God gives you a dream like he did to Joseph, it was so big, even Joseph, I don't think, really understood it. That's why he was a talking dreamer. And the more he talked, the more he was hated. He didn't really have a lot of wisdom. And so sometimes, church, God will give us a dream, and my encouragement to you is so overwhelming. It's so big because we serve not a little tiny figuring deity. We serve a living God that sits on the throne and is exalted and high and lifted up. We serve a God that made the universe. Amen. Let me tell you something. That's a big dream. I can't make the universe. I can't make the earth. I can't make the constellations. I can't make the solar system, but God did. That's how big he is. Our God is so big. Oh, that VeggieTale song, right? I know that there's nothing, nothing can stop me. Nothing can uh, cut me off because my God is a big God. He's an awesome God. So when he deposits a dream, it takes generation for that dream to come to pass. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in one week. It doesn't even happen in a year. It takes a long, 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 long time for that dream to come to pass because our God is so big that when he called Abraham to be the father of many nations, I will bless you, leave your country, leave your father's household, leave your people, and I will show you a land you have no idea. And Abraham walked by faith, and God said to him, come out of the tent, look in this constellation, count the stars. Abraham looked up and he started counting. And he couldn't count all the stars. Because scientists tell us you can probably see in the vicinity of about 600 stars with a naked eye on a clear night. He's counting and those stars speaks of the supernatural children that he was going to have. And those stars are you and I, the Gentiles, who later came to faith because of Abraham's obedience. In the book of Genesis chapter 12, God says, Abram, and he set out. He's 75 years old, and God said, you're going to have a son. His wife is beyond childbearing age. At age 90, Abraham was 100, and they have a baby. That's a God-sized dream. That's a dream driven by God that you and I have. We have nothing to do with it other than to trust God and not look back like the students were testifying, but to look forward. And to know and say, God, I trust you. I believe you. I know I don't understand it. I know I'm not smart enough. I know I don't have the talents. I know I can't do this. But I know you can do it because you made everything in this universe. And I'm going to trust you. And that's why it happened in Abraham's life. And the Bible tells us that God gave him a dream and it was fulfilled. Abraham's dream continues to this day. As a matter of fact, Abraham's dream will continue after today, tomorrow, next week, next year. You know what? We can leave this earth, planet earth, and the dream that Abraham had will continue to go into the future. It's, it's so incredible how God works. The vision he saw in the sky is being fulfilled every single day. You and I are part of that dream. The dream that God gives is bigger than us, number two. The dream that God gives 
that dream will not let you go. Every time you turn, that dream's going to be right in your face. That dream will greet you in the morning when you wake up, when you're all cranky and you're all upset about something, open your eyes and the dream will say, hey, I'm still here. That dream will get a hold of you. And that dream will cause you to pound the table. It will cause you to toss and turn. That dream will get a hold of your life. That's why Joseph continued to talk about the dream. It's got a hold of his life. It's got a hold of his heart. It's got a hold of his attention. Everything he does, all that he is, Joseph is now understanding the stream that God gave him will not let go. It will not let you go. It will hang on to you. It will eat you. It will chase you. It will not let you dismiss it. It will even haunt you, haunt you until you die. This type of dream will keep you awake in the middle of the night. This type of dream will always cause you to look to the future. Because the enemy and everybody else wants you to look at the past. Everybody said, look what happened, you fail. Look what happened, you, you're not good enough. Look at what happened, you're from such and such a place. No, they said that about Jesus. They saw Jesus preaching, and who is he? Where is he from? And what did they say? He's from Nazareth. And somebody said, what good comes out of Nazareth? What good comes out of Tupa City, right? What good comes out of uh, Shanto? What good comes out of Navajo Mountain? That's what they said about Navajo Mountain. Right? There's nothing good that comes out of that place. There's nothing in here. Jesus, the, 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 the maker of the universe is coming to them and there are naysayers. Church, can I encourage you today that you will always have people criticize you when God gives you a vision, when God gives you a dream. Young people, I want to tell you, God puts a dream, a deposit, a dream inside of you. You hang on to that dream, and I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what the status says. I don't care what the status quo is. I don't care. I want to encourage you. God is in your corner. God is behind you. All you do is set the sail, and the Holy Spirit will blow you in the direction he wants you to go. That's my prayer for you today. Young people, listen to me. A God-given dream will not let you go. Number three, a God-given dream you will be willing to die for. You will be willing to lay your, down, your life down on, and, and you will be willing to say, God, I'm willing to die. You see, that's another mark of a God-given dream. It, you will be willing to die for it. And not only that, but look at this uh, church. Jesus did. God had a dream. His dream was to be reconciled with humanity. His dream was to make what was wrong when Adam and Eve sinned and God's heart was to come back and know mankind. And so what does he do? He puts forth a game plan. The game plan in Genesis chapter 3 was this, woman, you will have a seed and that seed will go through generation after generation after generation, 14 generation to get to, to such and such a, a person, Abraham. And from there, there's going to be another 14 generation to get to David. And from David, there's going to be another 14 generation to get to Joseph, who will be betrothed to Mary, to marry Mary. And, and, and there's going to be a seed that will be conceived. And that seed, when it grows, he will come out of the wilderness when he becomes a full-grown man. And he will begin to do miracles and begin to teach and all these things. And then this, 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 this seed will teach and, and do miraculous things. And at the end of his public ministry, they will kill him. They will put him on the cross. They will bury him. And when he resurrects, this seed will crush the head of the serpent. He will crush his head and the serpent will bruise his heel. His name is Jesus, the one that resurrected. Church, I want to encourage you today. God had a dream and his dream was to give access back to you and me. 
All of us in this room, we can just at any time pray a prayer and say, God, forgive me, set me free. As these young people were testifying, I was thinking about that very idea and thought that God's greatest desire is taking place. We can come to the Lord and say, Lord, you know my heart. Search me, know me. If there be any wicked way in me, Lord, expose it and deliver me and set me free. That's what happened. And God gave that dream. So so Jesus, he died for the dream of his father. Paul the apostle, he says in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is power unto salvation to those that believe. And he says, of course, it's first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And and, and Paul says, now I've become an apostle to the Gentiles. And I will go to Rome because all road leads to Rome. And if I get to Rome and if I preach to the people in Rome, they will hear the gospel and they will take the gospel to the other parts of the world. And that was Paul's mission. His mission was to get to Rome, and of course he got to Rome, and, and, and he was in prison for a period of time, and at the end of his life, they cut his head off. His head falls into a basket. He dies for the dream he received on the road to Damascus. When Jesus came and visited him, church, I want to encourage you. There are many people that laid down their life for a God-given dream. The passion for a God-given dream will burn inside a person and it will drive them towards the plans of God. God's plans are big. Come on, church, you and I can't do it alone. We need partnership. We need others to help us. We need mentors. I was telling our youth leaders, more than anything, youth leaders, you need a mentor in your life. Someone that will speak into your life, someone that will encourage you. Matter of fact, young people, you need a mentor. Someone that you can look to and they can tell you the truth. And they can tell you when things are not right and they can speak to you and they can counsel with you. They can pray with you and they can encourage you. And, you know, that's one of the things I saw at the convention. I saw how leaders are praying with students. I see how tears are falling from the leader's eyes. Why? Because they're being given information about this generation. As a matter of fact, uh, Griffin was talking about the generation that's going to be born next year. They're not even on the radar yet, but they're already talking about them. I believe it was the beta generation. There's going to be the beta generation that's coming and the world that they live in is going to be totally different than the world that even the, the, this generation grew up in. That's going to get harder in every way. Are you prepared? Am I prepared? Can we minister to, to them effectively? Can we lead them effectively? Let me tell you something, church. These things are happening. And then the second thing is this, that Joseph had a dream that was hated by his half-brothers. When you dream a dream, you see, Joseph and his younger brother, Benjamin, were the only two born, same mom, same dad. The older, the rest of the older ones, they had a different mom and same dad. And so so what happened in this thing is this. The half-brother shows up, and they hated him. Because they recognized that their father, Jacob, favored Joseph. How do we know that? We know that because the father gets a coat of many colors and gives it to his son, Joseph. I mean, he loved his son. Because he was born to him in his old age. And so his half-brothers show up. People you live with may not like your dream. Not every person in your community will like your God-given dream. That's the principle. The principle is this church. People of different faith will not like your dream. Your neighbors will do stuff because they know you're a Christian. And they will try to discourage you. People of different agenda. And even people that you go to church with will maybe criticize and judge and, and, and kind of look at you sideways. Church, I want to encourage you. That's in front of you if you have a God-given dream. There will be naysayers all around, onlookers who despise you for no apparent reason. I mean, I can go into this in, in a lot of ways, but I just want you to understand that his very own flesh 
and blood brothers did not like him. They were jealous of him. They were envious of him. They were saying things to try to discourage him. They were saying, who do you think you are? You're just a little runt. You're just, you're just a baby. You don't know nothing. And, and there are other things that they said to him, and they did not like what he was saying. They're thinking against him. They're saying things against him. And Joseph had to learn really fast because now he's being betrayed by his own brothers. They throw him into the well. They take his mini color coat. They go out and they get a kid goat, the Bible says. They cut the throat of the little kid goat and they take the blood and they dip his many colored coat into the blood of this little goat. And they bring it to their father. And they tell their father a lie that said this. And the lie says, we found Joseph's clothing. He was eaten by a ferocious animal. Look, here's his coat. And the father's heart sank. His mind, everything in his life just came to a stop. And he wept. He cried. They had a memorial service. While the half-brothers are acting, their brother is dead, knowing full well that they sold him as a slave to Egypt, to the Ishmaelites. You know the story. If you read it, read, read Genesis chapter 35 all the way to Genesis chapter 50. That's the whole story of Joseph. And they lied about him. And, and look what happens. Joseph is now out of the way. Look at this. Even after he thought the father, Joseph was dead, he remembered his son's dream. What does it say? He treasured it. He, he, he took note of it. He put it in his journal. Everything his son Joseph was saying. Joseph, Jacob, remember his son's dream. See, so this, a God-given dream will be number one. This dream will be tested. You're going to be tested. It's going to be tried. You're going to say that this dream was given to me by God, but it's going to be tested by naysayers and people that will ridicule me and talk against me and belittle me and even betray me. What are you going to do with that dream? Are you going to let it go and dismiss it and say, okay, God, I'll go find something else to do. Oh, God, I'm not going to be a preacher anymore. I'm going to go and do something else. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to you know, sell cars or whatever. I'm going I'm to go back to school and I'm going to abandon ship and I'm going to leave it. Your dream will be tested. Number two, your dream will be shut out as it was done in the case of Joseph. Joseph, we don't want to see it. We don't want to hear it come to pass. The brothers all in unison says, let's see what becomes of his dream. We're going to kill him. We're going we're gonna, to, in a sense, murder him. And let's see where the streamer goes. You will hear those type of things. You will understand that those type of things are ahead of you if you have a God-given dream. Number two, number three, the stream will be lied about as they lied about his whereabouts. They told their father that their, his favorite son is now in the ground. He's now eaten. By ferocious animals. They lied about it. You know, when you are a person that God selects and God gives you a dream, you pursue that dream in your life, people will lie about you. They will say stuff that are not true. They will say things that will not be what it is, what it might be. And all these things will take place in your life as it took place in the life of Joseph. The last thing is this, the stream will be buried in Egypt only to resurrect down the road. See, God will always give you a dream. God will always give you a vision. 
And you will be so excited about that dream. You'll be so excited about that vision. You will be jumping up and down as this is the greatest gift you've ever received, and it is. And then God's going to allow it to die. He's going to have you watch as that dream is dashed and that that dream is cut short, that dream is lied about, that dream is compromised. It's gonna, it's, everything will be said about that dream and you're going to experience this just rejection as Jesus was rejected. See, Jesus was rejected. The Bible says he came to his own, but his own received him not. They said, we don't want it to this day. Israel, there are many Jewish people that refuse to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they would have a Seder meal. And at the Seder meal, they'll have one extra table and, 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 and dishware and a cup that says, that's, that's for Elijah. Elijah's going to come. Malachi's prophecy. That in that great and dreadful day, there was going to be one called Elijah that's going to come. He's going to prepare the way of the Lord. John the Baptist was that Elijah, a type. And he preached repentance. He prepared the way for Jesus, and they still reject him. They don't believe he's the Messiah. By the way, Israel right now is at war with Iran. And we need to pray for the peace of Israel. We need to, we, that's, the, that's God's timetable. And I want you to know that. And so Jesus was rejected. Joseph's father treasured Joseph's dreams. The father in heaven will always remember the dream he put inside of you. The father in heaven will always remember that he is the one in charge. He is the one that caused the vision and the dream to be deposited into your spirit. When you were a young man or a young lady, that dream you had, it was put inside of you. It was imprinted in your spirit. It was something that you thought about and always dreamed about and continued to dream about it. You would rehash it and you would uh, recite it and you would memorize it and you were given that dream. It will be hated. And the third thing is this. Joseph's dream came true through faithfulness. And there will be so many opportunities for this dream to be aborted. There will be so many opportunities. I mean, number one, it's being lied about. Number two, it's being hated. People are saying stuff about that dream. But let me tell you something. It is on you and me. It was on Joseph the moment he left that area into a caravan down to Egypt. He had to keep his heart clean. He had to keep his mind clean. He could not get bitter or else he will, you know, abort the mission that God called him to. And I want to encourage you today that there are going to be opportunities for that dream to be aborted. And it's on you to be faithful to God. The in God, but you have a song, have a prayer, understand and recognize you defeat all these naysayers, you defeat all these circumstances, you can defeat all these onslaught of the enemy, the attacks of the enemy by simply being faithful. See, when it's all said and done, this is going to happen. We're going to all stand before God. And when we all stand before God, God's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have done a good job. You were faithful on Monday. You were faithful on Tuesday. You were faithful on Wednesday. You were faithful on Thursday and Friday. You kind of got weird. <laughs> but you made it through. And Saturday, you felt bad. So Sunday, you went to church. And pastor talk about a God-sized dream and reminded you and encouraged you to the altars and you came back and then for the next three months you were faithful. Church, I want to encourage you. In spiritual warfare, it all takes place when we put on the full armor of God. When we put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. When we allow the belt of truth to be around us and our shoes 
that are shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When you take the shield and the sword, which is the word of God, and when you stand and you combat everything coming your way, you wield the sword, you fight. And Paul says, having done all this, stand against the fiery darts of the enemy. Because the enemy will not pull any punches. The enemy will come and he will not take no prisoner. The enemy will come and he will just attack you from every angle. He will use everything against you to try to bring you down. And I want to encourage you today, church. We need to be faithful in the midst of unfaithfulness. In the midst of hardship. In the midst of difficulty. In the midst of onslaught of the enemy adet o yun hik ishna anishton kha nahat edo ben nige besh e ben apa behadad not egon soz so da dostzen bedahos a nikito ni on our knees we see god we pray we 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 trust god to to protect our heart to protect our attitude to protect our behavior that we don't lash out that we don't come short but we fight the good fight of faith, as Paul said, he did at the end of his life. When you are in step with the Holy Spirit, when you are in tune with the Spirit of God, you are in partnership with other believers, this must come to pass. It's called partnership. This is why Jesus sent them out two by two. It's so important that you have, you, you have, a, you, you have someone you're going with. You have someone that, you're accountable to. It's so important that you're not only accountable to somebody, but someone to encourage you. Someone to pick you up when you're down. Someone to, you know, maybe even spur you on, the Bible says, to good works. You know that? It's important. That's why Jesus sent them out two by two. The Bible says two is better than one. Two has a better return than one person. Pity the man that falls down and have no one to pick him up. But blessed is a man when he falls down and his buddy's there to pick him up. Church, come on. We need to pick each other's up, not kick each other's down. Not talk down on each other's. One of the things I really love about the men's group that ha- takes place and the women's group, the Tuesday night, I know the women's group, they all do text. I can't take that much text, Sister Eva. Just like, don't bother me. Men's group, it's just like one word text. Praying, everybody say, oh, we're praying. (laughs) Right? We get together and we pray for each other. We love each other. We encourage each other. And I know there's a lot of funny jokes that go with it. Chris and Tim are always wrestling. (laughs) Right? It's all part of God's plan. That we have each other's back. I have your bag, you have my bag. We encourage, we help, we pray. Church, Joseph had to go through that. Check this out. You and you alone must give life to the stream. Remember, we are product of our choices. All the choices and the decisions we make today determines the outcome of tomorrow. Is cargo hodo nitiki? You are planting right here. You're planting a seed. Is there a seed of faith? Is there a seed of obedience? Is there a seed when Potiphar's wife is hitting on you? Joseph said, how can I sin against God in a foreign country? And he takes off from that place and Potiphar's wife gets a hold of his jacket or his robe and she cries murder. She says, he's trying to, he's advancing on me and he's trying to rape me. And she lies about Joseph's character. And Potiphar had no choice. If he wants to come home to his wife, so they put Joseph in prison. And now Joseph is in prison. But you know what about Joseph? He was faithful in prison. He served God in prison. I don't think, because he knew who he was. He knew who God was. He knew, Joseph knew and understood that he was clean in his heart. But 
Sada pahit edo, yat edo, yas anda, a jumping est anda, yo chipe elyande. Even though they lied about his character, he stayed faithful to God. And the Bible says he goes into prison, and scripture says everything he touches turns gold. God's blessing him. And because God is blessing him, he works with the prisoners, and the prisoners were growing, and they were getting better, and everything he's doing, and, and the warden recognizes what God, God's favor on his life, and so he gets even promoted in prison. And now he's probably a supervisor, a foreman of, you know, maybe a project that they're doing. And now he's having this, and, and the next thing you know, people put their trust in Joseph. They're coming to him because they're having these dreams. One guy had a dream, and he said, I had three baskets on, my, on, on top of my head. And then those baskets were bread, and the birds of the air came and ate up all the bread. What does that mean? And Joseph said, I have bad news for you. What that means is in three days, Pharaoh's going to throw a party. And at that party, he's going to hang somebody, and you're the man. Sure enough, he was taken out of prison. Three days later, they hang him. And then another man said he had a dream. And this dream was about, and his dream, it was different. His dream was as a butler, and he, and he explains his dream, and, and, and Joseph responds to him and says, you know what, in three days, Pharaoh's going to restore you back to your original position as a butler. And he had to do with pouring out wine which represents the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus that was torn. Salvation. Coming back full circle as Joseph interprets his dream. And the butler years later forgets about Joseph. And Pharaoh has a dream. And his dream was out of the Nile comes out these cows that were sleazy and fat. And they go along the Nile River and they, 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 they graze. And as they're grazing, another seven sets of cow comes out of the Nile. They were, they were ugly. They were scroungy, bony. And those cows come out of the Nile and they go into the fat and sleazy cows and they eat them up. And they stay skinny, ugly, and bony. And Pharaoh's startled and he brings in all these, you know, Men that, 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 that were considered magicians and, 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 and different, you know, they, they understood dreams and, and they all sat around. They tried to figure out what's going on. Nobody could interpret the dream. And then the butler says, hey, Pharaoh, I know a guy. Anybody ever said that? I know a guy. I know a guy. His name is Brian. Brian. I know a guy. His name is Joseph. Joseph, he told me about my dream, and that dream came to pass. So they summoned Joseph. Joseph comes before Pharaoh and tells Pharaoh, this is, he had two dreams, very similar. And, and, and Joseph said, you know, this is one and the same. What's going to happen is for seven years, there's going to be prosperity and plenty in Egypt. And then after that seven years, there's going to be a great famine. And when that famine comes, it's going to eat up all the resources of Egypt. Egypt. Egypt's going to be devastated. What must we do? And Pharaoh says, well, we need to hire someone that's really smart, that's really intelligent, that, that hears from God. And they say, Joseph, you're the man. Joseph gets out of prison, and he goes to Pharaoh and says, Pharaoh, you need to take 20% of everybody's surplus and put it in silos and put it in barns and store them for the seven years famine that's coming. And they do that. For the next seven years, they store and they, 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 they prepared themselves for the famine to come. And so when seven years was over, the famine kicks in and they were able to sustain the famine. Matter of fact, the people from around the world started coming to Egypt because they heard about the wealth. They heard about the sustenance, the resources. And what happened? These guys from Canaan, they show up. And they're all scared and they're full of fear for their lives because now they're in, in Egypt and they didn't know what was in front of them. And they turned to this man and it's their brother and they could not even recognize him. 
His name was changed from Joseph to Zephaniah. He wore a gold chain. His hair was all shaved off. And as he stood there with great power, they all bowed to him. And the way like they were worshiping him. And they begged him for resources. Joseph recognizes them. He goes into a separate room. He weeps and he cries. These are my brother that betrayed me. What they meant for evil, God meant for good. The saving of nations, the saving of lives, my own brothers, my father, my household. What does that represent? Jesus. Saving you, 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 you. Jesus saving us. Bringing us back from death to life. You and I are now believers because Joseph had a dream. Did you know that if you follow that dream that God gives you, that dream will save your family? I'm not saying the dream is the gospel or salvation. It, what, what, the gospel is the gospel. This is salvation right here. And I want to encourage you, church. You run after that God-given dream. As big as it is, as hard as it is sometimes, as difficult as it is for me many times. I mean, there are so many times I feel like I can't do this. I'm not able to do this. I, I can't keep on doing it. It's too taxing. It's too difficult, Lord. I'd rather, do, I, I'd rather just, you know, pastor a country church somewhere where there's only a few people. But it seems like God's giving me a different direction. God's saying that there's now a church in Kienta. You guys are going to plant another church somewhere on the reservation. And you're going to keep extending and keep growing. You're going to impact the Navajo Nation for Jesus. That's my prayer. That's my heart. Is that every native home in North America to receive a clear, adequate presentation of Jesus Christ. And I tell people all the time, partner, come on. Bring it on. We need partnership. Right here. You need to get involved. That's why, I mean, a lot of people are echoing that this morning. Church, Joseph had a dream. And that dream was used by God. Hallelujah. We give life by prayer to the dream. We give life to that dream by our obedience and always serving Jesus. A God-sized dream from above is always bigger than us. It will not let us go. We will be willing to die for it. That dream will be hated by others and it will be tested by time and seasons and circumstances and situation. How will you pass that test? By being faithful. Be faithful, church, to God first and foremost. Be faithful to your spouse. Be faithful to your children. Be faithful to your calling. Be faithful no matter what. And God's going to see you through. Amen. You will accomplish great things for God. Young people, God's going to use you guys. God's going to work through you guys. God's going to put a calling on your life. One day, someday, and I'm telling you, there's going to be preachers coming out of this house. God's going to be using this body to impact the world. I've always dreamed and envisioned coming to this house uh, 18 years ago. I used to dream how that we can take this church and we're not going to be on the receiving end. We're going to be on the giving end. We're going to be giving, 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 and not only receiving, receiving, receiving. We're going to be missional. We're going to be about, you know, making it hard to go to hell from our respective places. Amen. Wherever that is, God's going to send us. And by the grace of God, by the power of God, God's going to use you, and God's going to use me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for your word that speaks to us. Lord, wherever we are, whatever we go through in life, Lord, you're challenging your people constantly. You're challenging me, God, even as a pastor, as a leader, as a, as a husband, as a father, God. You're challenging me. I want to get better. Lord, I pray that we will be taking on the very character of Joseph. Lord God, who had a dream, and that dream kept him, and that dream caused him not to quit, caused him not to give up, give in. But Lord, that dream was the very thing that spurred him on towards you every single day. 
every single moment, every single hour when the enemy comes. Lord, the subtlety of Satan's plans and plots against our life to try to put us down, to try to discourage us and bury us and put us out of sight so we can be out of mind. But we are in the heart of the Father. The Father remembers all of our ambitions, all of our desires. The Father had recorded it in His mind. And He's keeping it safe. That even though we're lied about how that we died at the hand of a ferocious animal, the Father remembers. And you know what, God? That dream is going to come to pass. Church, can you stand with me today? Can you stand with me? You're here. God rekindled that dream that was laying dormant under the heart that's been hardened. Under a heart that has doubted. A heart that is full of fear. A heart that's become stony, unreceptive to the voice and the call of God. You're here today. You say, Pastor, as you are preaching this message, God is bringing stuff to my memory. God is reigniting dreams that he had put within me when I was a child, when I was a young person, when I was an adolescent. When I was a young man going to college or going to school, I was away from family and God put a vision in me and a dream in me. Or maybe like some of the stories we've heard over the weekend that people tried everything to medicate. They've tried alcohol and booze and this and that. And at the end of an empty bottle, they found Jesus. And now they're giving dates. 1990, I gave my life to Jesus. 1991, I got married. And, and, and now I've been married. I'm faithful. I've got children. You know, those, those were stories we've heard. Incredible stories. That can only be put in place by God Almighty. Hallelujah. Church, you're here. You don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Today's a good day to do that. Next week, we're going to baptize people. We could baptize you next week. You're here. And you say, Pastor, I need Jesus in my life. I've never accepted him as Lord. I've never professed him to be my Lord and my Savior. That's you and God speaking to you. I want to encourage you to respond. You're here and you say, hey, Pastor. This message, I know you're talking to young people, but I'm young at heart. And my young heart is being ministered to, it's being touched, it's being encouraged and challenged to rekindle the dream that God had placed inside of me. I want to receive that God-sized dream. I want to receive that dream that will not let go of me. And I'll be willing to lay my life down for that dream to see people come to faith, to see people come to Jesus and be disciple and, and to live for God. That's my dream. Maybe some of you here, you've been dreaming and praying and thinking and plotting all these years about seeing your whole family come to Christ. And you're the only one serving Jesus from your household. That's a good dream. That's an awesome dream. That's a God-sized dream. If that's you, why don't you come and why don't we make an altar up here somewhere and ask God to touch us where we live. Hallelujah. The supernatural vision that comes from heaven. The dream that Joseph had that he told his brothers and because of it he was hated. But it came full circle when they bowed before him and later they brought their father to him. And Joseph was restored to his family. That's going to happen even today. That's you. Why don't you come? Come on, respond. Don't hang back. Don't let the enemy lie to you. My dear sister, I pray over you today. And I ask you today that God would minister to you. Come on, church. I need some prayer. People, if you're here, you're a leader. I want you to come and help me pray. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Lord. For